Now this is a little bit of an after the fact sort of situation because I've already bored this out. But I figured I'd show you how I fixtured it down. Now we knew going into this that the crank and cam center line, that plane that's created by that, was pretty dead nuts even with the parting line. So I was good to just bore straight down with the case parting line on the table, no shims to even it out. When I bolt case down, I'm bolting it down over top of existing bolt holes, much like these. It gives a nice rigid spot to pull down. And again, over here. One thing I wanna stress is when you're doing that, make sure you're not over a T-slot here, okay? You don't wanna be over a T-slot because now you're gonna be trying to bend it and you're, these being cast aluminum, they are actually somewhat delicate. But if you put it over top of a nice solid piece of material, it'll pull down and pinch it nice and rigid. You don't have to kill these when you tighten them up. I like to get them um, about as even as I can. I don't know if you can see this or not here, but they're just on these little step blocks. And then I just toe clamped right over top of a bolt hole. Same again on this side. This I put here, this is just a, a T slot and some studs. And I'll show you what I'm gonna use this for in a second here. Because the first thing that we need to do is center up the head of the mill with a bore of a hole. And there's a couple ways you can do that. One way that you can do it is take one of these edge finders with this floating end right here, and you can use two coordinates. You can touch off one side, mark that as your zero, touch off the other side. Then you can go front to back, find the center that way. Now you got your two planes, your X and your Y, and you know where the center point is. This gauge though is interesting because it operates with the mill on, it will turn. So it has this little, the way this works is it has a lever here that translates horizontal motion like this into vertical motion of this. Let's see, I'll take the little safety off here for storage. Translates into vertical motion. See that? It's got just a little cam under here. It can spin all the way around on a ground surface underneath there. This gauge has a little arm right here that contacts a stud. So the way that we do this so kind of, you preload it a little bit, drop it down into the hole, let it go. You can kind of get it close to start with. See this, we know we're not wildly swinging the needle. And fire up the machine. Okay, now you can see the dial swinging back and forth. So I'll zoom out a little bit. So, now what we want to do is find the minimum needle movement. So, just pick a direction. That needle's moving more and more. So go the other direction, needle's moving less and less. And we'll do the other direction, same thing. The lock off. Okay. Now look. Needle's moving less and less. Let's try the other one again. Oh. Okay. We got almost nothing here. Alright, let me show you that. That needle there is just barely ticking. And these are very, very sensitive. So you know that that is really close to on center right there. One thing to keep in mind when you're doing this is when I set my stud up in here, I want this bar right here to be able to, uh, to be on a, a smooth part of a stud because 
this is going to raise and lower. So I don't want it to hang up on any thread. So make sure it's on something smooth. This is the tool that we're going to use to do our boring here. This is just a standard three inch boring head with an R8 taper. And we got the cross hole here. It's for doing really big holes. Center hole for doing really small holes. And this one on the outer edge for medium holes. So it's basically just a uh, cross slide with a dovetail gib and then a feed adjustment here. Now, you have to pick a cutting tool. My rule of thumb for picking cutting tools is always pick the shortest bar and fattest bar in that order. So, these right here are eliminated because they are not long enough to do the job. This shank right here, actually, let me focus. There we go. This shank right here is not deep enough to cut the depth we need. So eliminate those. Now we got the choice of these. Yeah, these two bars here are relatively similar in length. But this one's skinnier. So we're going to put that to the side. And you might think, well, this is the biggest, beefiest one. That's great. Let's pick this one. But I put an order of operations to it, the one that is just long enough and then fattest. So this one I'm going to eliminate because it's longer than I want. It just puts unnecessary strain on the tool. So this is the one we are going to select. Now, install this. The simple set screw on here. You'll notice there's a little flat. So we're going to slide this in our hole. And we're going to rotate the boring, well, the, sorry, the boring bar a little bit as we tighten that screw. And you'll feel it hit home. Give her a good snug. You don't have to kill it. Just don't want this coming loose. Okay. Let's go install this in our mill. Before popping anything in the mill, I always like to blow off the shank. Make sure that nothing's on it because that can throw stuff out of whack. Dropper in here. These R8s, uh, these R8 shanks have a little keyway on it that you gotta line up. So we're gonna find it. There it is. Janky power uh, draw bar I made out of a cannibalized impact. Works. It's crude, janky, but it works. All right, now we gotta get the cutter set on this. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna start stepping it over here to the point where we're just gonna touch off. There we are, we're just touching off right there. So we'll make our roughing passes about 50 thou. There's where we wanna be. Lock it down with the uh, gib screws here. Don't have to kill it. All right, Carter's ready to take the first pass. One thing that I find really helpful in all of this is setting the depth stop. And what's really neat about that is it's not something that you just come up to and bottom out on, but you can set your power feed to trip out at that same distance. So I tend, tend to set it up just in neutral so I can hand feed it. You'll see this lever pop up when it trips out. Okay, lock the spindle. Now, I can just come up with a table until that cutter right on the edge. And now I know that every time I set my cutter in power feed by doing that, it's gonna stop at the same depth every time. 